We are living in times where there is an assault on sanity. Political correctness has run amok and logic has been left by the wayside. Do you constantly ask yourself, WTF is going on in this nation? Do you sometimes feel like a stranger in your own country? Well, fear not. You are not alone. This is the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Show, coming to you from deep inside flyover country with your hosts, V. Wright and Jose Estevez. Welcome, everybody. It's WTF, and I am V. Wright. And I am Ho Ho Jose Estevez. Welcome to the show, folks, where four nights a week, Monday through Thursday, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, we come to you live, unrehearsed, unscripted, unfiltered, and PG-13, but never PC. This is the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Radio Show. Indeed it is, and if you would like to share our information with your friends, family, loved ones, co-workers, associates, people you meet on the street, whatever the scenario is, number one, I want to say we appreciate it. Number two, you can send them to our website, the WTFRadioShow.com. You can send them to our host network, Patriot Network News at PNNTalkRadio.com. Join up in the live chat over at PatriotsRide.org and give us a listen. You can go to Spreaker.com. TuneIn.com, iTunes, or iHeartRadio, all of which carry our show and host it. Thank you to all of those locations. In addition, if you would like to catch our show and listen to it on demand, you've missed it for some reason, or if you'd like to download it to send it to someone else to let them listen to it, you can do all of those things at Spreaker.com, YouTube, and iHeartRadio out of their archives. Uh within probably 30 minutes after every live broadcast our show goes live and of course if you'd like to call in and participate in the show we'd love to hear your comments and questions you can do so by dialing 313-462-0068 senor i'm furious okay well tell me why you're furious because um i saw a picture today of those nice little uh, religions of pieces in my favorite town and the town that loves me most in America, Dearborn Estan. Ah, Dearborn um, Stan. Yeah, that waving their ISIS flags. Now, if I'm not mistaken, they have said they're at war with us. Mm-hmm. And Imam Hussein in ISIS headquarters here in the United States in Washington D.C. also says we're at war with ISIS. Right. So, wouldn't that make them a free-range target? Uh, um, well, I suspect it it might, but I don't think war has been declared. I'm not sure how that all works. I really don't know. I just well, know that, I mean, yes, according I know what you've to seen, both, and it's a real problem. War. According to both, we're at war, and I was absolutely, I just, I wanted to make another trip to Dearborn so bad I couldn't hardly stand it today. Yeah, you you probably just need to stay away for the time being. Get it, catch your breath and stuff. <laughs> no, you I have no toys to carry to Dearborn. Well, that's what I'm saying. You probably just need to stay away. They they would like me less than they liked me last time I was there. <laughs> <laughs> just don't take your mom this time. Your poor mom doesn't need to get involved in all that mess. There's, she just doesn't need to. <laughs> hey, Duke would have been safe if he hadn't touched my mama. <laughs> Well, and that's a good point. That's what I'm saying. You know, we joke about it, but I mean, this is a serious thing, folks. And, you know, we look at what happened over in L.A. today. And, folks, if you're not aware, the L.A. school, the entire Los Angeles school district shut down today because of an alleged threat, I guess, from the religion of peace and 700,000 students missed school today. Um, And people are saying, you know, that the terror threat was a hoax the school terror threat was a hoax you can say what you want but as far as i'm concerned they're probably just judging reaction i I suspect that's all it is is because think about one person really do you let me ask you this let's sit here and say it say it it's a hoax big Mm -hmm. deal are you really willing to risk those kids lives that it's a hoax no No, however new york city did new york city did Yep. New York City, because the same yeah, email threats right. went to New York City, mm-hmm. and they did not. And right. uh, Los Angeles County says, we're not taking any chances with our kids, even though the uh, FBI is saying it's not a credible threat. You know what? It was credible enough to come from Mideast. That's where the email generated from. 
Oh, really? Well, yes. and like I said, you know, it's a tough one because I've got having kids in school. I can totally agree with what you're saying. But I'll tell you what, they, they see they're, they're, they could be testing. They could be testing and seeing, you know, and how many times are they going to make the threat? And then finally they don't react. And then something. Ha- I mean, I'm just think I'm just thinking. Well, out loud I, under- I don't know. I understand that. I'm but I'm going to I'm going to say is- I'm going to say this. It is easy to say, and I mean, guys, trust me, I get it. I've got no love lost in Californication. Right. I just, I just, Mexico there, I've got, two. yeah, Mexico too, um, USSR of America. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I have, I have no love lost out there. However, right. um, if one of my grandchildren were in a school that got a threat such as that, and something happened to them because oh, of the be inactions of the mm-hmm. school system. The amount of damage that the terrorists could do would pale in comparison. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, there, there's no, there's no good thing that can come out of that. I mean, they do it, and like you said, something happens, or they don't do it a couple times, and you know. It's it it can't go anywhere good. It, it's, they're in a tough spot, um, but like I said, I suspect. Uh, and then, like I said, maybe it is just a prank or a hoax. Then again, maybe they're just testing. Maybe they're just uh, pushing the system, seeing if they can how far they can push the system and what reactions will be. Well, I mean, this goes back to we have these problems primarily because we've got people walking around in cities in Houston, in California, in uh, Twin Cities, Minnesota. Um, in Dearborn, in New York City, Mm -hmm. in South Florida, walking around waving ISIS flags. No, you want to wave an ISIS flag, given the fact that we are, you can sit here and say we have not formally declared war, but President of the United States, Imam Hussein himself, Mm -hmm. straight from his office in ISIS headquarters, said we're at war with ISIS. Mm-hmm. That should go out to every law enforcement in the country that if you see somebody with an ISIS flag, you take them out because they are an uh, enemy combatant. But that ain't going to happen. I mean, look, you've got stuff coming from the FBI. I mean, they can't even call them Muslims, much less Islamics, uh, jihadists, or anything like that. So you got a real problem here in this country. Real, yeah. real problem. Here yeah, but it's going to have to be handled. It's not going to be handled. But I mean, it's not going to be able to be handled by... by um, by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, uh-huh. um, it's it's going to have to be handled by local law enforcement. It's going to be ha- have to be handled on a state level. States have really got to get a damn clue and get off their asses and exert their independence. Uh, have you seen the new omnibus that they're planning on passing in the next two days? No, I, I have not. Was, I thought it was last time. week. Um, they have pushed it forward until, you know, right before their recess so they can bail on oh, it. Oh, of course. Um, but uh, Paul Ryan is funding uh, in the new omnibus bill. Him and Nancy Pelosi sat down to dinner last night and still could not come to an agreement that would allow them to limit uh, the blank check on Obama. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you something. This blank check for him on these uh, Syrian refugee hotties mm-hmm. um, in this new omnibus is 185000 over the next year. One hundred. Now, wow. you say, okay, 185000 in our, in our, you know, that's no big deal. That is in addition to the 400000 that they're already authorized to bring in through USAID that they have funding for. That is in addition to the visa program. So we're talking about somewhere between 600 and a million of them next year. 600,000 and a million that they will be authorizing them to legally bring into this country. Right. But they're going to do yeah. it. They're, they're going to do and, it. Yeah. 
And the sad thing is, a lot of people that are already here, even though they don't have, uh, they're not yet American citizens, they're talking about getting them registered to vote and doing all the other thing. That's even more scary than the other thing, because that you know you got an election coming up in what, uh, well, eleven months. Little, well, little that's less than 11 months from now. You know, the the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, uh, Imam Hussein has said for quite some time, number one, he'd like to run for a third term. I think that mm-hmm. if he could get the people on the rolls uh, and, and have a massive outbreak to um, halt, delay the election, I think that he would have uh, allocated enough numbers to to allow him to alter things so that he could run a third term. I really do believe that. Um, the other thing is, is I'm not, I, I'm telling you, even if we have an election, everybody's getting all keyed up. Don't you, you people understand there's a reason that they're timing this out like they did. They fraudulently stole the last election, which bought them four more years. Four more years to lay in place everything that needed to be laid in place to assure that the numbers were on their side. Everybody's saying, oh, Trump, you know, um, oh, Cruz, the freaking the Rube, Rubio. All um, of them. Just... You know, all of them are, are talking. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I really don't see where any of them have a chance in hell. And I understand uh, Donald Trump's numbers went up to 41%. He broke the 40% mark. And I'm going to tell you, he still doesn't have a chance in hell. Because this election is going to be stolen. Unless, unless he is willing to defy the RNC when he loses and take it back legally. Oh, I wouldn't be that. That wouldn't surprise me at all. That wouldn't surprise me at all. That's in, that's interesting. Yeah, unleashing lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Well, I mean, Romney could have done it in 160 he counties in prime in prime states. In prime states, he could have done it. How in the daylights do you go into a county that is stati- it's statistically impossible for 160 percent? of the entire re- registered voters in your county to all be Democrat. It's just impossible. It's not that long ago. Do you not remember the lawsuits and the resulting chaos from 2000? What was that, Gore and Bush? I mean, my God, how long was that tied up before we finally knew who won? Hanging chads. I mean, all of that stuff. So it's not like it hasn't happened in, in this century. I mean, I, I was making a joke it was last century. It was 2000. So it wasn't that long ago. And they fought tooth and nail. Both sides did for that. And then, of course, remember, there was, uh, what's her name, Kamala Harris. Was that her name down in Florida? You know, Supposedly, she threw it to Bush, and you know you had hanging chads, you had Supreme Court involved. I mean, my goodness, that was an absolute mess. So it's not like it hasn't happened before. Well, it needed to happen the last election. Romney should have challenged it, but he didn't. You he has no spine, which, I mean, <laughs> of course, you see his running mate running the mm-hmm. House now, and you understand that he has no spine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are worthless. They are just so worthless. Uh, this road is so paved to the road to hell. And, I, you know, yeah, you'll hold on to your guns, but you'll still be law-abiding citizens. I mean, you know, um, right. and you will accept the tyranny. And the tyranny is becoming more and more oppressive while we wait on the next election. Is that what it's going to take is for the next election? What, then Hillary Clinton gets it? Mm-hmm. Or is it going to take, is what it's going to take to people to get off their butts and do something is for imam hussein to say i'm not leaving yeah is that what it's going to take i i'm going to be honest with you and i don't like to be pessimistic i don't know what it's going to take people are good at talking they're good at tweeting they're good at doing all these things but i don't know what it's going to take you know now people are saying well i don't know I, I don't want to say any more than that. I'm not advocating violence. I'm not obviously that would be the absolute last thing. But I'll tell you what, folks. While you're sitting over there arguing over whose candidate is better, um, the people that are in the Senate, which is several of them running, why are they not working 24/7, 365 to stop at least slow down the invaders coming in? And they're not. They're campaigning. That's they're why. campaigning all the time. My God, do you get one job and you go and do another job? 
How the hell long does that last in the private enterprise, folks? You tell me right now. Hey, I got this job. I just got it, but I'm going to go do this thing over here. And your boss says, oh, that's great. Bullshit. You're gone. Bull crap. I mean, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what we can say anymore, but I'm sick of it. They ran to do something. They didn't do it. I, I am just sick of this stuff. You don't do that in private industry. You don't do that in the real world. And we let them get away with it. And it's crap. They're supposed to be there fighting for us, representing us. These invaders are coming in by the tens of thousands. And they're not even trying Wait to slow minute. it down. What they're using people? it as a campaign slogan to run. And that's there all of them except for people. Trump. Because he's not, run, he's not in the Senate. He's not in the House right now. He's not a politician yet. He's trying to be. But he's, that's the only way he gets a pass from me on that. Because I'm going to tell you. The rest I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say this. Number one, there are people. People that say oh they're representing us what people misunderstand yeah. is they're not supposed to be representing them they're supposed to be mm-hmm. representing the majority right period you're supposed to be doing what the majority wants anybody. not what the minority wants not what your handlers and buyers paid for mm-hmm. but what they you know what they want the other thing i want to say is um Um, with Trump, I, I I went brain dead for a minute. With Trump, one of the things that is appealing to him is because, and you can say what you want to about him, but he's the only one who has actually set himself up to be a public servant. He has said that if he takes the if he wins this election, he will accept one dollar for well, pay. There you go. One dollar for pay, and I understand that you know he's a multi-billionaire and all this, that, and the other, and that he really doesn't need the money, etc. But you look at some of the others who have run and their financial <clears throat> background, and they didn't need the money either. I mean, let's let's talk about you know that job does not pay enough to spend a billion dollars in advertisement. Okay, um, yet they're running for it. And then they, you know, wholeheartedly accept that paycheck, and which I think, what is that paycheck now? Uh, four or five hundred thousand? It's it's somewhere. In, yeah, I remember four twenty at one point, four hundred twenty thousand, something like roughly. Right, that, so. right, somewhere between four and five hundred thousand. I don't recall what it is currently. You know, they give themselves raises, so there's it's kind of hard to keep track of. Um, but for a four hundred thousand dollar a year job, now Trump could take that check and 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 be well within his right. But it's more along the lines of public service. And you know what? That's really where we need to do. Where we need to be is we need to scale back all of their paychecks to uh, military pay grade. Uh-huh. Military pay grade never Agreed. being Agreed. never being able to go beyond an you know uh, an E eight twenty year retirement period. Mm-hmm. But V, I'm going to tell you something right now. You could pay. You could say you're going to pay them zero. Look at the people behind him. You think Obama's affording these multi million dollar mansions in uh, Hawaii and stuff like that? No, it's always somebody's buying the property or something, or you know he's going through somebody. They have so much money behind them. You could pay them zero, and they're still going to do it until you stop the flow of money behind them. Which, to be honest with you, is probably impossible, virtually impossible. Every one of them up there on that stage tonight is receiving millions upon millions upon millions from people that have. Have an axe to grind or something that they want, folks. You can say what you want about your perfect candidate, but all of them, and once again, not an endorsement of Trump, except for him apparently at this point. I think he did have a thousand dollar plate dinner, but of course, if you look at everybody else with their twenty to forty thousand dollar plate dinners, you know, uh, good for him. Okay, great for him. I still couldn't afford it, but but regardless, but all of them have million have billionaires behind them. All of them have billionaires behind them that are pulling their strings. So you can say, well, mine quotes the Constitution, or Rubio, you know, he's not. Well, whatever, folks, go for all of them. They all have multi-million dollar and billion dollar people behind them, and that is the fact of it. And you're telling me right now, folks, that if you have a billionaire behind you that's funding you, that's keeping you on the road all the time, keeping you flying everywhere so you can miss uh, your Senate votes and stuff like that, so you can campaign, you're telling me you don't owe them something when it's over? If you've got one ounce of brain in your head, one ounce of common sense, you know doggone well that they're bought and paid for like a common whore. Exactly like that, except at least a common whore will admit what they do, and these people won't because they're politicians. And oh, we're we're for the goodness of the United States. You know, we're going to bring back this and that. 
bull crap. Well, again, I want to remind everybody, everybody talks about these leaders that we've got that are running. Um, where is that leadership? Because I am not seeing it yeah. in Washington, D.C. And mm-hmm. any time that they have decided to filibuster and, and stand up there and go on these rants, um, not one time have I seen any of them with any support with them. So if they can't lead their own uh, co-workers then how are they going to lead those same co-workers they can't. They can't. as president if they're not willing i mean if they're unwilling to rally with them now uh it, you know it, it it's it's ridiculous it's not going to happen and all of the flip-flopping you know i have to give ted cruz credit where it's due and that is he has not done a whole lot of flip-flopping he has kind of stated his case and held his, you know, held his ground. But the rest of them, man, could they get any more all over the board? Mm-hmm. That's true. Hey, you know what, Pete? We've got a great show tonight for everybody. And, of course, we got Suzanne on with us. And I hope you weren't right in the middle of a thought. But something just popped up in my social media, and we have got to mention it. We cannot be remiss, and I don't want to miss it at the end of the show. Um, five years ago today, agent uh, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was murdered. So just keep the family in your prayers. I see they're posting a lot of stuff today. And of course, they just had a, a fairly good win life in prison for two of the scumbags. I wish it would have been an immediate death by firing squad hanging or something like that. It wasn't, but um, at least they got two of them. There's still several more yet to be apprehended. And there's one more waiting sentencing, I believe. So God bless the, the Brian Terry's family, Kelly, Terry Willis, his sister, Kent Terry, their mom, um, dad, just, just everybody involved. Good people. And they have been through the ringer in the last five years. But um, today marks the fifth anniversary of his uh, murder. So, well, prayers for Kent and Kelly and and the rest mm-hmm. of the family. Definitely. And they are, you know, friends of the show, wonderful people, uh, very grounded, down to earth individuals, uh, easy to talk to, doing wonderful things with the found Dead Brian Terry Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, if uh, you guys get an opportunity to, then please go to that web page. In addition, yeah. uh, Kelly. Uh, Kelly Terry Willis uh, just released her first uh, child's book that was co-written, yes. and uh, it's going to be part of a series. So if um, you're into children's book and you want to support a great cause because those proceeds go to the foundation, then by all means, pick up that book for your child and get yourself signed up for that series. But we do have Suzanne with us tonight, and she's been Yay. sitting idly by, patient as all get up, <laughs> and we appreciate that. But uh, she's going to be joining Joining us, Suzanne. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everybody. Uh, oh gosh, she scared Welcome. me for a minute. I was like, please don't let her <laughs> yeah, say what she's a delay going potty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little bit of a delay here too. It might be the weather. We're getting hit with a pretty big storm up here in the mountains. I but sure I hope. Uh, I'm sorry that you missed last night. I hope you're feeling better. I am, and I was going to say something about that, but we kind of went right off into the tangent. Um, But yes, uh, yesterday I was not feeling well. I was feeling under the weather, was unable to be here, and I appreciate all of you guys for sticking by us and all the kind well wishes and everything else that was amazing and phenomenal, and I do appreciate it. Um, I don't get knocked down very often, but when I do, it's usually a doozy. (coughs) Well, and it does happen to the best of us, so, yeah. But we're back in full yes. effect. Yes, we are. Um, hey, I will. Um, I will remind you guys. Um, I will remind you guys, all of you listeners out there. I will remind you that the week between Christmas and New Year's, we will be running all broadcasts. That will not be a live week. We take one week at that period of time, and then we take another week in the summer that we run so two weeks out of the year we're not with you guys those will be the two weeks are one of those weeks are quickly approaching because we want suzanne and jose and myself to spend time with the people that it's really important to spend time with there you go yeah thank you and we do need the downtime we miss our we miss this too yeah, yeah, you guys opportunity. doing this four nights a week. Uh, hats off to you. <laughs> Good opportunity to vent. Apparently we need it occasionally. <laughs> 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 so Suzanne, what's what how was your weekend, darling? I had a really good weekend. We 
uh, the snow started here on Sunday and it really has not let up. So we're just kind of hunkered down and enjoying st- our, our lives up here. Wow. But wanted to just chime in a little bit. I guess we have another debate going on tonight and that'll start after the show. And uh, once again, just want to try and redirect everybody to the focus on what our founding fathers really had in mind, what they envisioned for the office of the presidency when they drafted um Article 2. You know, when we have these elections now and, and talk about the the presidents, everybody calls him the leader of the free world or the leader of the country. It, it, it was never intended to be that way. The most powerful branch of government was intended to be the legislative branch. The president was simply supposed to preside over that legislative branch, and his his powers were, were few, just to name a couple, commander-in-chief of the Army, Navy, and militia. He could ask for depi- opinions about... Um, from his department officers regarding their their duties. He can grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the U.S. except in cases of impeachment, uh, making treaties with the consent of the Senate, which, you know, brings up the whole Iran issue, which we've already discussed. Advice and consent of the Senate. He can appoint ambassadors. He can fill vacancies that might occur. But during these these whole debate processes and the nomination phase and the election itself, we hear about the president fixing the economy. What is he going to do to um, to negotiate with other nations uh, or or go to war against other nations or to fight ISIS and to essentially be the the chief police officer of the entire world? That's not what he was intended to be. I heard one commentator say, "Well, when we have a president that's weak." the whole world uh, <laughs> suffers unrest. And that's what we're seeing, but that's not the way, that's not the way it should be. And the, the one question we should be asking the, the, any prospective president is, do you intend to preserve, protect, and honor the Constitution? And that's surprisingly or not surprisingly these days, the one question we never really hear asked. The only person that we hear really talking about the Constitution who means it is Rand Paul, you know, um, and again, I'm not endorsing any particular candidate because I'm of the mindset that um, I don't think it really matters. And even if we do pick a candidate, the the elites in the GOP are going to go against what the people want. They're overwhelmingly right now, for what right or wrong, again, I have no opinion on the matter, saying we want Donald Trump to be the GOP nominee. And uh, I, I think they're going to do again what they pulled in uh, 1964 with Goldwater, George Romney was was also key in that little in that little charade, which tells me I, I, that it also reminds me of why Mitt was probably chosen. You you did indicate he never challenged one of those. No, he didn't. Um, Absolutely not. Voting fraud, egregious instances of voting fraud, and he let it all go. I thought he threw the election. He didn't even he didn't even fight. Nor did McCain. Oh. Remember during the debate, he said, "Hey, look, you have nothing to fear from President Obama." I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Thanks for bringing that up. Important point. He did. He, he just simply sulked away. I don't even think he sulked away. Probably hop, skipped, and jumped away. He didn't seem that concerned about it at all. And we're all sitting there like, what the heck? I mean, we've got precincts that are showing, what, 105, 110% turnout in many, many major cities. It wasn't just uh, isolated. And there you go. He just walked away. Simple as that. And, and we deal. had the... We had the Mideast that was still smoldering. Um, and what did he say? What did Obama say before he was elect- elected? He said, should the political or the winds shift to an mm-hmm. ugly direction, I will stand with my Muslim, Muslim brothers. And look what's happening now. Now he's doubled down on the plans to bring all these unvettable um, soldiers. I call them soldiers, not refugees. Um, yes. To bring them all in. We cannot check. And look what's happening now. We had San Bernardino. Now we're having L.A. That might have been, like you said a test it could have been a hoax but to me i think what their major weapon is going to be until they really get cooking is disruption 
Right now, yes. they have the power of disruption. They can send an email. They can make a phone call. And look what happened with our little clockmaker and what happened to the teacher. We're looking at a $15 million lawsuit. How many teachers are going to be afraid to open their mouths right now? Mm-hmm. So we've got disruption. We've got a chilling effect on reporting suspicious incidents in the schools. And we're going to see more of this. I believe we have a caller now. Uh, we we actually do. We don't we don't have actually a caller. What we have is uh, the guest that you invited to be with us tonight. Um, I, I'm going to hand this over to you, Suzanne, and let you do the introductions. Uh, Fantastic, S- Senor, chime in. Okay, we'll do. All right. Well, tonight we have Colin Flaherty, who is the author of Amazon's number one best-selling white girl bleed a lot his recent book is called don't make the black kids angry and it is a book that is kind of painful to read thousands of incidents of egregious black mob violence on the population and the book discusses the fallacious uh, argument that there is a war on black people in this country by um, white people and uh, that being said, Colin, welcome to the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Show. A pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We discussed this last week, and when I asked if there was any incident that uh, you really wanted me to bring up on the show, your response was, you know, just just address the book as it, as it impressed you. And what really struck me was that we seem to have a group of four enablers um, that are putting forth this this false proposition that blacks are just the uh, perpetual victims in our country. And um, I'm not going to put them in any particular order, but I'll list them and then perhaps we can go through them um, in your time on the show. And the ones that I was thinking were the, uh, polit- the politicians from the top on down. We have the media who's complicit in falsifying stories and their slant on it. Really important, I think, is to discuss the school system and what's going on in our educational system from the bottom on up through college and then also the victims themselves does that sound like a adequate assessment of what you've put forth yeah sure and and so let's back up for a minute and tell people what this book's really about sure. this book is really we document it's not a theoretical book it's a book where i document all these examples of two things black mob violence and black and white crime on one hand on the other hand, we document how people ignore, deny, condone, excuse, encourage, and even lie about it. So it's not a theoretical discussion of all these all these theories and causes and solutions. It's like the book answers one question. Is this happening? Oh, absolutely it's happening. And so that that's that's what the book's about. Okay. So yeah, your list your list sounded fine. Okay. So um if there's one main theme as to what the cause of this violence is on the black community's part, on the rest of, of, of you mentioned Asian, Asians, gays, whites, what is the main cause of this according to those that are putting forth this lie? The big lie is that today there's one cause, one cause only for this epidemic of black mob violence and black on white crime. That is white racism. That explains everything. And this is now a mainstream point of view, easy to find on MSNBC, Salon, Atlantic, CNN, anywhere, not challenged. And uh, it's kind of crazy how, 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 how untrue it is, but how, so, how it goes unchallenged all the time. Well, I think an interesting thing was is when you look at other news networks and things like that, when you discuss the media, you have situations where the CEO of Sam's Clubs, a black woman, publicly announces that she, um, uh, you know, um, judges by gender and race. Uh, She is, And, and you know, here's the thing. There's crazy people out there all the time, right? But what we expect when people say people in somebody in position of authority says something crazy, we expect a reporter to go, oh, really? Or why do you do that? But we don't get that on this kind of stories. No. So here we get the CEO of Sam's Club going, oh, yeah, I want to see a bunch more. I don't, there's too many white guys around here. And, and that doesn't strike anybody as being 
you know, racially conscious and corrosive and damaging? Of course it is. However, we had situations across this country less than a decade ago in which uh, many uh, corporations were being lambasted because they did not uh, because they did not have, quote unquote, enough minorities working for them. Yeah, you know, that that's obviously true. It's transparently true. We've had 50 years of racial quotas, affirmative action on uh, all sorts of race based initiatives. And, and today, the result is today we live in this most racially conscious country in the world. Yeah. You know, we, we, live in a, we live in a country with black colleges, black churches, black funeral homes, black sports leagues. You go down the list. And, well, and our and, government and, 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 but here's, is, but here's the point. is 70% When I go to a black. reporter and I go to a reporter and I say, what about black crime? The same people who were reporting on all these race-based institutions look at me and go, Colin – I'm colorblind. <laughs> mm-hmm. So here's the thing. When you meet somebody like that, our solution is not really to debate with them because if that's what you say, you are past the point of responding to reason. So I don't really debate with the clowns and the trolls. I really just try to expose them. Well, I think the mainstream media has done a very good job at at uh, exposing itself. I mean, we have a situation where uh, we know that the Black Lives Matter uh, organization is being funded uh, by many big pockets, and everyone thinks it's about race and 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 police brutality, et cetera. But it's also about. I mean, they've got a, their own little division on climate change and how that's affecting. That's why the black folks are still in the ghettos because of climate change. Change, damn it! Um, hey, 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 did you happen to see? And this is something I have. I just did a. I'm writing about for tomorrow's American Thinker. We can talk about it now if you want. Did you happen to see yesterday's Washington Post, where they gave four Pinocchios to the story of hands up, don't shoot? Oh, it's you know we've been reporting on that since right. you know since that whole whole hey, hold on, thing hold on, hold on. I understand that. Hold on. But here's the here's the interesting thing. So they listed twelve Pinocchios, right? Twelve big lies. Mm-hmm. But for eleven of them, it was always like this person told the lie, and here's the lie: lie or lie. lie. They t- paired them up. Except when they got to the hands up, don't shoot. Uh, that was a lie, but they didn't really tell us who was the leader in spreading the lie. And at the front of that list is, of course, the th- thousands of editors and writers at the Washington Post itself. Absolutely. And and here's the thing, it's not just a news not just in the news stories, right? They put it in the arts, the entertainment. I mean, how many store how many stories were there about like musical awards where everybody in the award show did the hands up don't shoot routine and the Washington Post did a glowing review of their bravery and their honesty all based and, on a lie. And the so sports, now the, wa- and now the, the biggest teams. lie of all is the Washington Post is trying to convince us they had nothing to do with the lie. That's that's the biggest lie of all. So they lie about their own lies. <laughs> no, it's like it goes around and around. Well, the other thing that amazes me is is the simplicity of um, of their arguments. I mean, you you quoted very early in the book Joshua Adams of Ebony, who essentially, I I think your quote is that, um, what's sadder is if their analysis, uh, I guess regarding the black crime, uh, fails to take in the residual effects of the sadistic prolonged assault on our people that was chattel slavery. So they're still bringing up the slavery issue, and we have this sense of white guilt because somehow we are all descendants of slave owners and and profited from their misery that we should buy into all this and not question their their line of thinking does that sound accurate oh yeah and and if there's one thing that i don't think people listening to this broadcast know really know is how widespread that attitude is you know just it was nothing that long ago i'm talking just a year ago or two years ago where when you talked about the epidemic level of black mob violence, black on white crime, and this enormous disparity between black crime and white crime and black crime and Asian crime, we all had the same excuses, right? Fatherlessness, motherlessness, sisterlessness, brotherlessness, a thousand more. But now, today, that's all off the table. It's all about white 
racism. And this is mainstream. And I just don't think enough people really, really realize that. Well, when when you and I first spoke on the phone, I had mentioned um, Eric Holder and what he had said on his first day was that we are a nation of cowards. And subsequent to our conversation, um, I got into the part of the book where you expounded upon um, what he really meant that we're not we're a nation of cowards for not talking about race. But what did he really mean? Can you tell our our listeners what he was really getting at there? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you exactly what he meant. He meant that you. And I are cowards about race because we are not brave enough to admit that our white racism is what is responsible for all this black pathology all over the country. That's what he was talking about. It's another thing like I don't think enough people really realize exactly what he meant there. Yeah, I mean, I that, that didn't I I didn't take it that next step, and and uh, apparently the shame eluded me. I don't know if I feel bad well, about that or not. I'm thinking a, I don't. There's a, there's a there's a book out there called Courageous Conversations. This is the manual for teaching this kind of craziness in grade schools and high schools, and they kind of get into it a lot. That exact image and phraseology. Because if you're going to be a teacher now, you have to have the courageous conversation, mm -hmm. which is to be courageous enough to admit your racism is responsible for all this uh, disparity between white people and black people in schools. So it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting how weird weird it is. Colin, well let's let's so, focus okay. on on this. Go ahead. No, well, Senor, go ahead. I, I wanted to say something to Colin. I, I've got a daughter. I've got two daughters. One of them's in ninth grade. And I notice more and more that she's coming home and saying things like, if, if we'll say things, it's like, oh, that's sexist or that's racist. And it's starting to, it's really starting to concern me because I don't believe that those are terms that I ever used probably the whole time I was in high school. I, it, we might have thought about it, but we, you know, she's starting to use that more and more. We'll say like little comments. And like I said, they're very innocuous to me and my wife. And we'll say things and she'll say, well, gee, that's kind of sexist of you. And they are, so you're, they are really pushing this and those young grades and in, in the public education. There is no doubt about it. And here's a test. Mm -hmm. If your daughter comes home from school and she knows who Emmett Till is, but she doesn't know who Ronald Reagan is, then your your daughter is basically being subject to this thing I was just talking about, how these ah. teachers are kind of indoctrinated. It, it's just astonishing mm -hmm. what kids are learning at school, how yes. untrue it is, but how there's no never a pushback, right? Right. Well, I'm going to ask her that now, knowing me, and of course you don't know me, the uh, uh, Suzanne does, and the listeners do, but trust me, she knows who Ronald Reagan is and many other people, but that's interesting, the Emmett Till thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk, have a little talk you with know, her and see. The, the thing that I do in schools, mm -hmm. which, is, which is alarming to me and should be alarming to parents, is not e that's not even the most alarming thing in schools. Mm -hmm. The most alarming thing to me is the level of black crime and black on white violence and black on teacher violence black on neighbor violence that i've documented all over the country now we're getting the teachers unions to step up and say oh, we can't go to class anymore they're not safe uh places like baltimore places like mm -hmm. st paul philadelphia these are where the unions are stepping up and protecting their teachers and so okay. well i don't know what kind of school your go daughter goes to but i think i don't think enough parents are really uh, aware of what's happening minute to minute in their schools as far as their kids being safe. Mm -hmm. They are well, not. Well, our, our school's smaller. It's more rural. Um, the, the, uh, the breakdown is definitely uh, overwhelmingly white. Um, I know some people say, oh my gosh, you know, your daughter's not, you know, being ex exp exposed to other races. She is, trust me. But I mean, yeah, so I mean, predominantly that. So I'm not so worried um, about that aspect of it, but like I said, just what they're what they're learning on a daily basis, and just the fact that she's using that word racism and sexism so much, um, and at her when I was her age, no way, not not even probably dad, the things I was dad, thinking about have, at that point. Dad, you have your work cut out for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Agreed. You know, you raised an interesting point about keeping the school safe, and um, mm -hmm. when I was, I lived in San Francisco in the seventies oh, yeah, when they hear, yeah, started. I'm eager to hear this story. Go ahead. 
Oh, yeah, we talked about this. Yes, when um, they started implementing the desegregation and the busing. And my family had purchased a, a little home in a, a quiet neighborhood where I could walk to the neighborhood school. Well, I went there from kindergarten, to, and then in the summer of third grade, I heard my parents talking about busing and about Hunter's Point. Now, being driven around the city, I knew that Hunter's Point was a very scary area. It was where there was a lot of crime and uh, it wasn't a place that you would go to. You would uh, avoid it at all cost. Okay. Well, it turned out I was going to be bused to Hunter's Point and the kids from Hunter's Point were going to be bused to my neighborhood school, which was one of the main reasons my parents purchased that home. Um, now, there were no main freeways going there, so I probably would be spending two hours each way on the bus. And so... I will never forget the day this actually happened. My, my dad actually went in and spoke with the principal and was able to get a, a slight deferment, a deferral until I could move, till we moved. But I will never forget the day that those buses arrived. My slate was clean. I had no impressions of black people whatsoever. I lived in San Francisco. It was a diverse neighborhood. We had no issues. But these kids came off that bus. Mind you, this is grammar school age. They came off that bus. It was an invasion. They were looking to fight everybody. They were hostile. We could no longer use the bathroom. The first time I went in the bathroom, I got my face smacked. And we had police officers present on the campus for the first time. And I remember reporting to a police officer in the hallway, this girl right there, she hit me in the face and I had a mark on my face. It was red and swollen. And he didn't even say anything. He just sh shrugged it off, and, and that was that. And uh, I, I, I remember seeing kids, my friend's brother held by the arms while three or four black kids were punching him in the stomach. His face was bloody and head hanging low. Nobody did anything. This wasn't integration or desegregation. It was an absolute invasion. And I think we have a caller, too, that's going our, to share our, her story. Our caller keeps coming in and out. I will oh. encourage them to call back. Um, okay. Please do. Uh, make sure you turn down your volume i want to remind everyone turn down your volume otherwise you come into a live show and you feed back through our system so please turn down your volume uh caller please call back and we'll get you right in you'll just be patient just a moment but colin does my does my story sound uh similar to what you've been hearing uh -huh. around the country with that era you know what so take your oh without exception no, I didn't say nine. I didn't say largely true. I said a hundred percent true. So <laughs> take your experience, okay? Now, to figure out how many kids experienced that in your school, then multiply that by the number of schools around the country that experienced similar things. That's a very large number. That is a number of hundreds of thousands of white kids who were victims of black on white crime and violence from busing, 70s, 80s, 90s. It's an enormous number. It's, it's, I can't even get my mind around how big the number is. I can't get my mind around how many parents let their kids be subject to that. Yeah. I do a lot of podcasts on that. My next book is actually going to be collections of letters from people who have direct experience with black on white crime. There's going to be a lot of kids talking about what happened to them in school. Oh, I, I'll submit. I'll submit my thoughts on that. <laughs> oh, I would love. I would yeah. love that. Yeah, there you go. Just you know what? I was actually thinking. You know that. what's you interesting that, about? I the was whole... thinking I was going to get your 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 comments transcribed. No, Sorry. we'll we'll follow up and I'll I'll get that to you. But what's interesting to that um, is is the double standards um, with regards to just shifting gears for a second with deporting um, families, splitting up families, or not or denying children that are here illegally with their families. Um, making sure that we don't split them up, making sure that they get an education, all under the premise that we don't want kids to pay for their parents' wrongdoings. But here we see kids like me, kids that were bust, kids that were su you know, subject to this, this violence by these invading, these invading uh, kids. Um, we had to pay for Absolutely. a wrongdoing that not even our families had anything to do with.
That's so really you're even you're stretching this beyond another group of individuals that were not going to be held accountable at all. So white people can pay the price and be punished, but kids of color certainly will not be. You're absolutely right. Hold on for just a moment, Colin, before you uh, address that. We have a caller on the line. Caller, what's your name and where are you calling from? Oh, hi. I'm Char from California. Hi, I'm Char. Sure. Hi, Char. And, what's, uh, what's on your mind? Well, I was just listening to Suzanne, and um, I can totally relate when she was talking about the school situation. And, um, you know, it's so outrageous. I'm not prejudiced against anybody. And I, um, you know, it's just this whole thing that goes on against, you know, the white people. And, I, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, I, I remember people joking about different races, but it wasn't ever... Um, violent or anything weird like that and I I had to go to school in DC for like a year and a half when I lived with my mom and um <clears throat> you know I was uh you know I it was three I guess they bust these kids in from bad parts of town and um I've just never seen such hate against a race before they hated my guts because I was white and I just never you know like I remember um, playing kickball one day, and I I was, you know, didn't miss the ball or something. The girl punched me, and and then I and she said for me that I had to change places with her, and I punched her back, and then they both jumped me and beat me up, and then one time, you know, me and like the other three or four white girls <laughs> that were there, we were on the playground, and they surrounded us, and they took these weeping willows and they were kicking and punching us and hitting us with these weeping willows and berating us for the whole hour. And I mean, I thought we were like in embryonic balls. We were just like, don't kill us, please. And I, I was traumatized by that. Like that I couldn't even, when the teachers finally saw us, you know, after recess was over and nobody was moving and they saw these girls and they finally broke it up and saw us sitting there on the ground, you know, I mean, I was traumatized. And so, I mean, I, I just don't get like, you know, I know that all this terrible history has happened and I feel awful about it for some of the black race, but not, you know, why, why do you feel people? sure? I've got to, I'm, I'm sorry. I got to step in here. Why do you feel guilty about something that ended 150 years ago? I know. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I don't feel guilty about it. I just, feel bad that it happened but it's not my fault and well, it's not I, f- I feel you know, bad for, feel bad for me my Irish ancestors were slaves too <laughs> I, I know what you're saying I, I, get I don't it, hear the Irish I, squawking <laughs> I mean I'm just saying I'm just I mean uh, I'm know, just being totally just honest crazy. here I get your saying I, I understand but I but I see, that's the mentality. Like, see, that's what they're that's what they're counting on. That's their in. That's their door in. If you shut that door, then that play does not work. But right. that's their in. Oh, you've got to you you should feel guilty about what your ancestors. Dude, I didn't live 150 years ago. My fault. Well, none of my ancestors had slaves. None of my ancestors wanted to have slaves. And, you know, remember that there's Abraham Lincoln and then all the people on the north, like none of them were into slavery. So, yeah, wait, 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 you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. You're you're dead wrong. Abraham Lincoln's wife's family had slaves. And when he filed when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he exempted many northern states from it. And when that occurred, where was it that that was it was it Atlanta, Georgia, that that big mass of black folks were strung out in the street? No, that's right. It was New York City hmm. up in the great north. OK, hold on. Let me let me jump in here for a second. OK, listen. Go ahead, Colin. This is not. This is not a. I, I, when people start talking about history, to me, that's a deflection. Char, you just told an unbelievably important and valid story. We're not going to deprecate that story or marginalize it by by talking about history. Let's ta- mm-hmm. keep the story on Char. What happened to her? Now, here's yeah. what I observed about her. You, Char. Yeah. One, the first thing you felt like you had to apologize. We are the victims of the violence. We should not feel, we don't have to apologize. 
We don't have to use euphemisms anymore. The people who brutalized you and laughed when they did it, they did not come from a bad part of town. They came from the black part of town. Agreed. This was black on white crime and hostility. I don't have any trouble naming that. I'm not a historian. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a theologist. I'm not any of those ologies. I'm just a guy that says, this is happening right now. And there's a lot of people being damaged by it. Shar, your story is so important to me. Multipl How many times do we have to multiply your story uh, 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 around the country? Uh, hundreds of thousands of times. Right. And well, I'm not discrediting. I'm not like discrediting the, the century. I'm not yeah. discrediting what her story I, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I live in Savannah, Georgia. The actual city limits of Savannah, Georgia, over the last forty years, has grown to a population with Savannah State College, which Imam Hussein visited because it held such important, vital uh, vitality here in the state of Georgia. Um, we have a 70% black population in the city I've limits. I've written, about, I've written many times and talked many times about Savannah. Well, exactly. So, I mean, I, I can totally relate, and I'm not discrediting her story. I'm just saying, when we open the door for the apology, when we have that mentality of, being apologetic for something on the apology like it wasn't like i was apologizing to the black people i don't like what happened but i i was just saying what happened in my story that's all i just it, it, it's no. and it was not good and it it i just don't agree with um all white people are bad because hey, sure let me ask you a question part sure. of, of time sure let me ask you a question do you ever tell yeah. Do you ever tell your friends or your family today what happened to you when you were in school? And what if, if so, what do they say? Uh, well, my mom said she, you know, I talked about this recently with her, and she says, I don't remember that. But I probably didn't say anything to her when I was a kid. And, um, you know, but when I tell my friends, I mean, people just, they don't say they anything. They don't believe you. They don't they, believe no, you. I think they believe me because they know me, but they just, they can't. I think, you know, or some people have, you know, like, I know Suzanne has her own story, too, so listening to her, so they have their stories, but um, I, I haven't run into anybody that didn't believe me, but it's, um, like, they don't know what to say, some of them, you know, but uh, it, it's just sad. I, I just, I wish... You know, the interesting thing is... Yeah. I don't think I ever even told my parents that that had happened oh, to me. Interesting. I don't think I ever said I can't even go to the bathroom in the school now. I never told them my friend Wyoming's brother Noah was being held by a group of black guys who was circled around him. The teachers wouldn't help. His face was bloody, hanging over. His knees were buckled. They were holding him up so they could continue to punch him in the stomach. Somehow... At that age, I was seven years old. Somehow it just felt like it was appropriate, like it was to be expected. Mm. Here they are, and this is the way it's going to be right now. Keep your head down, shut your mouth, just deal and with deal it. with it. Uh, yeah. Well, it, was like I mean, prison. it was like a prison for me. I had to like get smart when I was like, in fifth grade, and I got smart, and I started realizing... If I give some, some of these, like I found out who the strongest chicks were, and then I would bring in my little candy bars for lunch, and I would give them, I would kind of pay them off to protect me. Wow. <laughs> and so if anybody messed with me, I'd, I'd go, hey, you know, so-and-so, and they'd come over, and the other person would back down. So it was like a prison yard. It was crazy. Wow. But I got and smart, this is, and I learned yeah. how to do it, you know? And, it's, and, it's and let a, me ask you something, Char. How old are, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 52. Okay, so this has been going on for mm, better than 45 years. And you want to know yeah. why your children don't uh, don't respond or don't understand because this is the example that has been set for them every day that they've attended school for the last 45 years unless you've lived someplace where the population of blacks is extremely decreased then you've been you know somewhat insulated from this but you, you know i mean my brother uh, my brother is a professor at the art institute and 
for a few years, he also did double duty as a local um, teacher at the elementary, one of the elementary schools here in town. And he got to a point about two months into his job that he carried a, a six hour voice recorder and he recorded every one of his classes because of the language and the behavior and the actions that were occurring with first and second graders and he oh. says well when you say something to the parents the parents like well master wouldn't do that because he you know that's that's what his name was he had one named mr master and one named master smith so <laughs> i'm just telling you but this is this is what you're dealing with and you've got parents who come in and you know they got gucci handbags and and jimmy Choo shoes and just as ghetto as you can be have no concern whatsoever for what their child uh did or didn't do for being responsible or for being there for the purpose of education but don't say nothing to my baby you wait you ain't supposed to say nothing to my baby what the hell colin you mentioned in your book that when we have these instances of bad behavior that they're looked upon as misconceptions. Well, first of all, it's, it's a product, obviously, of white racism on the part of the mm-hmm. teachers. Um, and the schools aren't designed to teach children of color. But you also say um, it's a result that we're being accused of misinterpreting black behavior. Can you expound upon that, please? Well, this, yeah, this. This is the theory from this guy, Glenn Singleton, he, Dr. Glenn Singleton. He's the guy that wrote. Yeah, I'd like to discuss him. We'll create this conversation. Hundreds and hundreds. This book is being taught in hundreds and hundreds of school districts around the country, including entire states, California, Wisconsin, Connecticut, other states. And so that's what he says. He says that we need more black teachers because white teachers don't get it. They they don't get that black kids are different. It's funny, like if you and I said this, we it's you know oh it's my. funny. Glenn Singleton, Glenn, it's funny. Glenn Singleton said this at a press conference. Then then the the, the head the the head of the Department of Education in California he goes to the conference. It says the exact same thing that Glenn Singleton said, which is well, black children have different learning styles, and just because they shout out in class sometimes, white teachers misinterpret it. That's really just something we learn in church. As soon as he, the white guy said it, all the reporters jumped on him and said, what are you talking about, you idiot? That's not true. <laughs> when Glenn Singleton oh. said it, everybody patted him on the back. There's so much, Here's what I've experienced. When, when I hear people talk about race and read about race, about 75% of it is pure insanity. There are purely people saying crazy things that go unchallenged, and that, 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 fits, that fits firmly in the 75%. I, I agree, and the double mm-hmm. standard, the hypocrisy. Is it fair? To, it- Go ahead, Suzanne. Go ahead. Well, my question too, when you bring up Glenn Singleton, it seems like this is a a, a money making proposition for him. To um, you've mentioned in the book about how teachers have to go to these training seminars. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the experiences they have and what they have to do when they go to these seminars that he puts on? Yeah, so so they're required to go, and you know the average, you know your typical new teacher is of course a young white liberal woman, kind of fresh out of school, mm-hmm. and so they're sitting in these in this room, and there are black people in the room, black teachers, maybe some older, but mostly it's mostly these young white women, and um, you know anybody who puts and they're totally cowed, and they and and, and but anybody who puts their hand up and says, uh, I don't I don't think I'm a racist. I have lots and lots of stories from teachers who said my contract was not renewed once I said that in this class, in this seminar. So, you know, Glenn Singleton, again, to his credit, they're not dancing around it. When they talk about, they don't talk about bad neighborhoods or bad schools. They talk about black neighborhoods and black schools. And so when Glenn Singleton talks about teachers, he's very explicit we don't like white teachers teaching black kids. That's a bad thing. And this is a this is a point of view held by many school board members around the country. And it's just as crazy as you can get it. 
And it's, you know, and it's okay for the black populace to come forward and make such a statement. However, the white populace cannot come forward and make such a statement. If they do, they're racist. The hypocrisy is is unbelievable, but people are afraid to challenge it because you see the thug mentality in that particular Mm -hmm. section of America, and most white people are afraid to challenge it. Okay, I don't that's fall the in that news. category, but that's I'm just the, that's, telling you. <laughs> that's the that's the bad news. The the good news is a lot more people, a lot more white people are starting to speak the truth and demand the truth. Let's, I see that a lot. It's connected. I see a lot of people reading my book, passing it out. I mean, last month on YouTube, I, I now get millions of hits on my YouTube channel every month. I do a lot of videos on this. and I write a lot of articles on it. So there's a lot of people that kind of know what's going on. They're getting more and more willing to speak the truth. And so what I'm trying to do is actually trying to give them a vocabulary, how to speak the truth, how to talk about this in a way that's not full of stereotypes, not full of generalizations, not full of hypotheticals. We have so many facts. Let's use them. Very true. Just also explaining, just to um, go into a little deeper, clarifying Singleton's thoughts on this is not i'll just quote him he said he singleton says white talk is verbal and intellectual Mm -hmm. and task oriented while color commentary is emotional and personal he's essentially saying they're stupid i mean could you imagine if if somebody that wasn't making money and being apologists tried to say such a thing imagine if donald trump said this oh my (laughs) (laughs) oh my could you just imagine and here is this guy probably making a fortune off of this listen we're not listen um, we're not communists i don't care if the guy makes a billion dollars i care what he says and what he says is unbelievably it goes to his motive it goes to his motive and his integrity listen okay i know listen if you want to condemn somebody for making money good for you i don't i condemn him for 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 spreading this malicious and hateful and deceitful point of view and and that's what we have to concentrate on senor well i was just wondering i wanted um colin to be a little bit more specific about because he said so many things so i kind of wanted to be a little bit more specific about what uh what specifically you think uh, that he's you know the hateful things that he said and stuff like that because obviously everybody has lots of opinions about pretty much everything he says so well you know what 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 susan just said was a very good example so he has a big book my book is all lined up and marked up and uh, he's very explicit about we you know we got to have okay here's one thing Okay, here's one, here's my favorite Singleton story. He'll, he says, this is him talking now. He says, sometimes parents will come up to me and say, yeah, but I've noticed. And you could just hear the apology and the hesitation in these questions, right? He goes, Dr. Singleton, I kind of noticed that in my school, well, you know, some of the black kids, they kind of like, they kind of like to fight a little bit. They seem a little violent. Am I, am I wrong for noticing that? And what Singleton says is, no, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not why black people are violent. The question is why white people have been violent for 400 years against black people. Oh. Now, the mo- main point of the story is not that Glenn Singleton is some nut job on a street corner yelling at people, but he is a major academic right square in the mainstream of ac- uh, 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 of mainstream academia and educational institutions today. And and not enough people know that. Wow, Suzanne. Well, this really this really goes to uh, the core, for lack of better words, of of what's really going on in our educational system. It's indoctrination. I believe in the book we go on to say that it's considered ra- a form of racism to actually focus on um, individuality. You know, they want to focus on the collective, which feeds into their whole um, their whole idea of getting uh, socialism and big government and um, 
So uh, when you want to focus on the collective that feeds into the government goals, and then you can actually draw the race card by saying, no, I really believe in personal responsibility and individuality. Well, then in that case, you're a racist. So then people are afraid to even espouse such ideas, which coincidentally are in conformance with the founding fathers and the ratifiers when we put forth the Constitution and put this union together in the first place. So how convenient is it that this puts their agenda into effect while at the same time shaming those who might try to oppose it. You know, there, there's no doubt that racism is the most corrosive form of collectivism. And I think that was very well observed. Well, well, thank you. you. You've got to have <laughs> more white folks that are, that, are, that are like me. I guess I don't have any shame because I don't care. Um, I've grown up around it. It's, um, it, like I said, you know, my location kind of speaks for itself for what the population and demographics are. And I am not going to back down from it. And I'm going to tell you something else. Shabazz is from here. And you guys all know who Shabazz is. Mm-hmm. Lucky um, you. Remind me who Shabazz is. He's uh, the, the... Malik uh, Shabazz. Malik, yeah. Yep. Um, he he's big in the Muslim movement and anti-whitey, and that's the problem that we have in this country. But I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But for the most part, in this town, hey, why didn't you write? A, you should, you should write a book on this. <laughs> why didn't you write a book on this? Because I'm not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> should. But, uh, no, I mean, we, you know, we have that situation, and we do have Savannah State right down the street, and we do have a vast amount of crime in our town that um, our city does not like to make public. Um, but it is, it is just a fact. Um, but for the most part, even the crime that we have primarily is black-on-black crime. And within the demographics of this town, we have not seen the uprising of black attitude that doesn't mean it's not coming it just means that Mm -hmm. maybe we're kind of a little slow or pace here and it hasn't gotten here yet but uh we haven't seen it here yet but one of my concerns is one of my favorite stories comes from savannah can i tell the story sure do you remember the story from last year when a bunch of tourists from atlanta went to savannah for mother's day do Do you remember that story i do indeed it was all over the news. Yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. Remind us what it was. Go ahead, tell us. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll let you lead it out. Okay. But it was okay, all there were, over there were the two, news. Two families, two families from Atlanta came to Savannah. Two white families, just regular old families, bunch of kids. They go to Savannah for Mother's Day. They're leaving their restaurant, walking down the street. All of a sudden, they're surrounded by a whole bunch of black people. They're knocking them over. You know, cursing them, taunting them, harassing them. One of the dads steps up and says, hey, what's going on here? All of a sudden, the dad's getting the hell beat out of them. All mm-hmm. of a sudden, the families are running down the street looking for a place to for, for to hide. So they go back to Atlanta and they go, man, we just had a really bad experience with black mob violence in Savannah. And the Atlanta, Atlanta TV was going, hey, what the hell's going on here? So the mayor and police chief of Savannah come out and go, oh, yeah, we know what happened there. The white families were picking a fight with the black mob. It's the white family's fault. And that is exactly and why that mayor is no longer have, mayor uh, You of this discussed city. a similar. That is exactly yeah. why the mayor uh, is no longer a mayor of this city. And, and uh, hopefully oh, things will change. Know. But, yes, that did occur. I mean, we've had situations where tourists have come to this town and they've left River Street and headed to their cars, which may be, you know, five, six blocks away, maybe closer to Forsyth Park. And um, been accosted and had to shoot and kill. And that has happened in this town. Uh, little little college girls come into this town all the time uh, going to party down on River Street primarily um during major events like uh saint patrick's day or what have you um i mean you know a big problem we have here as far as academics is that we have the public school system however when you become such a problem in the public school system that they expel you you are then still eligible to go to school in a private facility now, uh, I got a personal experience with this with uh, teenage 
Are you sure you didn't write a book on this? You should have. <laughs> no, I got a lot to write a book on. I was going to say, I think she's got several books mulling around in her head. <laughs> oh, okay. But I mean, you know, sure. I think I've read your book. Go ahead. No, but I mean, you know, that's one of the situations that we have here, and and uh, the the unfortunate side effect is that um, you get these ramped up uh, young men that are incapable of behaving themselves in a public school environment. Okay, so here's the difference between what you're Mm -hmm. saying and the way I wrote my book. Mm -hmm. I would never say what you just said. I gave specific examples. Over and over and over. Okay, well, I'll give you saying. an ex- specific example. How's this one for you? My 14-year-old daughter was accosted by a piece of shit black kid that got kicked out of public school at her private school, and he ended up on 30 years probation. How's that for you? Wow, well, it's a good one. You ought to write a book about it. Well, you know, I, I have was, to. With I generally to the don't get education that. System, I, I generally don't get kid- that that personal but then that's what i was trying to say is these things occur and you could put them out of a private school they fought to get in to the public school system the government wanted to integrate them now they want to separate i say let them separate the biggest problem we've got in this nation is not necessarily that but you've got the muslim brotherhood teaming up with the black panthers and you've got the funding of the likes of george soros promoting this activity Hello, it got quiet. Yeah, it no, got I'm, quiet. No, I'm basically, no, I'm basically waiting for the interview to start up again and for the monologue <laughs> from the other person to stop. So anytime I'm here waiting for You know, you uh, the other uh, the other issue you had brought up in the book was the um was how the teachers are also being subject to attacks on I know a gentleman was just convicted today um, of murdering a 24-year-old teacher, and it rec- it, it it reminded me of uh, when I graduated UCLA in the 80s that I, I got a letter from the um, Los Angeles Unified School District that even though I had no teacher credentials, they were offering me a teaching position uh, in the inner city schools. And I didn't take up the opportunity, but a good friend of mine did. And uh, she you know, described to me just exactly what you put forth in this book, the violence um, that was being being put upon to the teachers they were being physically abused you discuss in the book about the um the abuse the physical verbal abuse that these teachers are taking um but you also say how the teachers don't seem to want to do anything about this or the the principals can you explain why that is and what's going on in that regard well, you remember St. Louis, right at the same time we were all coronating St. Michael of Ferguson, um, this, the, the local, the Saint, the, 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 I think it's the Post-Dispatch of St. Louis, they ran a big story about this exact topic, incredible mayhem and violence and chaos in black schools. They, they, and they said that like 40 to 50% of the teachers, remember, were largely white teachers, they quit on the very first day on the job. And so, and and the ones who are left, they kind of make a deal. They just with themselves to ignore a lot of this. But there's so much. You know, like you, you were talking about kids getting suspended. There are many places in this country right now where they do not suspend black students for misbehavior. They're very explicit about it because somehow suspending them is what causes the criminal behavior instead of kind of the other way around. And the principals. Lots and lots of examples of teachers going to principals. And, and here, here's my, my favorite. I've documented many of these. Teacher, white teacher goes to the black principal and says, listen, Johnny, Mary, and Jimmy just assaulted me, and they've been doing it for a long time, bad things happening. The, the principal looks at the teacher and says, that's your fault. You cannot control your classroom. Wow. A yes. lot of that. Lot, yeah, a lot Do of you that. think, I, I, I believe you, you mentioned also that one of the, the principal asked the teacher, well, I... Uh, are, do your kids like the work that you're giving them? Are they happy with the assignments? The the just the I guess the, the rationale of the question being, um, if they're bored or they don't like the work you're giving, expect to get your ass kicked in class. I mean, this is crazy. That is crazy. That is 100 percent true. What you just said. Lots of lawsuits. Teachers are bringing lawsuits now. A teacher in New York. 
you know, documented how for years she was subject to physical and sexual abuse at the hands of her junior high high school students. And finally, she documented it in, in, in court until somebody finally took her seriously. It's it just cannot get any more insane. And you know, I don't know how I don't know how this is going to end well. Let me ask you something, right. Colin. Okay, because I've discussed this, and I, you know, you know what the scenario is. We all know what the scenario is. I think most of the public at large. I think the biggest problem uh, is what Suzanne and Shar both referred to, and that is. Um, not feeling for whatever reason not going to their parents so i think if parents don't know it's because their children are not telling them so the parents need to have this conversation with their children to find out what is occurring in their schools and in their environment their their education environments am i correct 100 percent. i was kind of referring to that too is it ed the other personal is it ed i'm sorry jose Jose. what's your name Jose, sorry. Jose. Uh, I was kind of I was kind of referring to that with Jose like when I talk to parents, I mean not not just I mean parents don't know what's happening. The kids aren't telling them. I, mm-hmm. I talk about I, 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 I the other day I saw a, a kid that grew up in my neighborhood. And I said, "Listen, I remember when we grew up. I went to Catholic school, they went to public. I remember you guys would come home from school every day and with all these horrific tales of black on white violence in the school." And I said, "Am I remembering that right?" He goes, "No, you're not, because it was a lot worse than you th- than you remember." And 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 none of the parents knew. And here's the thing: how many parents want to know? I hate to say it, but that's the truth. Oh, good point. So how do we resolve? Here's the other it? thing, how do, too, how do, Colin. I mean, hey. how, what is the, what is a solution to this? Because you're not going to force parents to be courageous. The, for some reason in this country, white people think that. They have to take it. They're, you know, that the thuggery is acceptable, and they're fearful for whatever reason. Um, so, what is the solution? Well, I don't know any other way to fight a lie than with the truth, and we just have to keep hammering them with the truth, not with theories, not with not with generalizations, but with specific examples that counter this fairy tale that we keep hearing every day. The fairy tale we hear is that black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism and violence. So we, so that's what I do in my book, and that's what I do on my YouTube channel. I'm constantly posting stories of, but they're, they're, of, of, but- of long-term and, and nasty behavior behavior black on white that is documented often on video and 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 that's and that is that is fantastic and i applaud that effort however what the fight there's no however if you have any other ideas do them okay no if you have a great idea do it okay i I, i'm going i don't hear any idea all i hear from you is well colin this not this not no no see here's the thing the reason why we're in this jam now is because too many people don't know how to talk about this in a reasonable and persuasive fashion. And that's okay? what I'm going to that's ask you. I'm so how do you combat? So how do you combat? So how do you combat when you are having this conversation and either the black person across the table from you or the white person says, "Well, we really, you know, we, you know, it's just horrible what happened to them in slavery. It didn't happen to them." So when you've got a situation where any conversation that you have is justified by an event that occurred historically 150 years ago without any basis except we deserve reparations you did this to us and it doesn't matter if it was you it was your bloodline it doesn't matter if it wasn't your bloodline you imported to america and you're the right color skin so how do you combat that if you want to sit here and say well you combat it with conversation give me the conversation to have okay so well, I think I'm going to interject for a second. I think I think the cure or or one answer is education. You have to, and this book puts forth a, over a thousand examples of why we don't have to be distracted with issues of the Emancipation Proclamation or slavery, et cetera, when we have just countless examples of what is going on. It's it's. Um, put forth on video you have it available and we just have to combat i mean here's here's just to go off track a little bit was going to when when this happened to me when i was a little girl 
I looked at this police officer. I had been raised to think that police officers are our friends. If you need help, you go to a police officer. I went to him after I was assaulted and he just shrugged and left. So my, my thought was, well, a person and a figure of a, uh, an authority figure here turned me down for help. Therefore, he must be right. I'm not deserving of help. We have to realize we're available. We can help ourselves. We have to stop being the victims. We have heard uh, in, this, in this book as well, victims, and we've read about this in, in various news accounts. Well, you know, I was robbed. This was a college student. I forgot where. I deserve this because of my white privilege. I deserve to be robbed. Oh. Or oh, there was another dead. one, Colin, I think you put, uh, maybe it was in Seattle or, or Oregon, where the victim somehow got into his attacker's brain and said, well, it wasn't racially motivated. I mean, how would he know that? He never had contact with the attacker. He was making his excuses for the one that... Um, that assaulted him. I can't. Uh, I but can't Suzanne, understand that. White but guilt. Suzanne, you're sitting mm -hmm. here and you're saying we have to move away and we have to educate. But you're having to have this conversation with people who, uh, you know, the two examples that you just gave were both 18 to 24 year old individuals who had spent no less than the last 12 years of their lives being told that they should feel that way because slavery occurred. Okay, and because so, there was a well, civil rights okay. movement. I mean, okay, so, all right. and, and, you, and, write, you know what? Go you got to write, you do. You have to write your own book. You got to do this. Well, Here's you know, if I had such expertise, I would. Obviously, okay, so, I don't. Okay, so I so run a radio the, show. Here's the thing. Go ahead, Colin. Um, when you're looking at somebody who looks at you and says, listen, this black on white crime is justified because of 400 years of slavery. That's an irrational position, and 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 and, you, and there, it's so there's there's no there's no reason to expect reason to emanate from that. And so I don't really want to argue with those people. I'm just satisfied to expose them because a lot of the times people won't they think that, but it's they they sometimes they don't say it. And so we have to expose the 10, 20, 25 percent of people who really do believe that. Because I don't believe that everybody else knows how firmly and widely held that belief is. So if somebody says to me, "They're ha you know, what about white people doing this for 400 years? It's like, okay, if that's the reason that that old person got killed last week, then I will accept, your, I will accept you believe that. And we just have to let it go and let, let, we have to depend on other people to figure out what a bogus answer that is. And guess what? People do figure that out. Colin, I've got a question for you. I wonder if you've ever run across this. Um, I was with my employer. I, uh, we had ethnic diversity training. It's mandatory for everyone. And we sat in there, and I heard a term that I had never heard in my entire life. I have heard of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder or syndrome. They refer to it as two different things. Um, I had We had a couple black ladies in our training, and one of them was very quiet, and she just seemed to go along to get along. The other one said... And she looked at the whole group, and there were probably 30 of us in there. And she said, you, you people, I think you folks or something, will never understand because you don't have post-traumatic slavery syndrome or disorder. I can't remember which term she used. And I just about fell out of my chair. Have you ever heard of such a thing? And oh, my, yeah, in yeah. my opinion, as long as they keep having the idea that they have something called post-traumatic slavery syndrome, when that was, what, several hundred years ago, they're never going to get past it. Yeah, I, re I did a story and a video on that when, when a city council member in my little town uh -huh. gave, gave a big speech on that. And, of course, the historical justification that she used for that was she had just seen the movie 12 Years a Slave. So that made her an expert. I'm not kidding. This is like not this is like the truth. <laughs> My. And if you if you watch kind of like all across the country, I mean, people just pick up whatever there and use it for an excuse. Right. So post-traumatic slavery disorder, why not? But just because they offer it, you know, but here's the thing. I'm not suggesting everybody's in the same position no. to, 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 to say, hey, that, that's BS. Because in your, in your job, I'm not suggesting you were. Because you have a job and you have a life and you have a family to take care of. Other people are in a position to say, hey, wait a minute, that's insanity. And that's, that's, that's kind of what my book and videos are for. It's like, here's a lot of tools for you to use to challenge this insanity that we see every day that you experienced in your seminar. Mm-hmm. 
Well, you're absolutely right. Well, I think what comes to mind when you mention... When you mention that is, um, for instance, uh, when we I wanted to bring up the media a little bit, and what comes to mind specifically is the issue with uh, Trayvon Martin. Now, we've all seen the picture of the little darling when he was 12 years old, but fortunately, we have other ways to... Um, uh, you know, we we have ways of seeing the truth of what he he really was. But um, you know, why don't you go into a little bit about the media and how they are also participating in these lies? Maybe um, in the Trayvon case or in Baltimore, if you don't mind. Well, I always write about two things, right? The racial violence, which is in, which is kind of nutty. But really, what's nuttier: the racial, the black on white crime and black mob violence, or the reporters who look at it and say. I don't see anything there, Colin. So the Trayvon case was a good example. The St. Saint Ma- Michael of Ferguson was good. Freddie Gray is a good example. The reporters are just part and parcel of this whole thing, just saying, you know what, this is all normal. And they, on, on some level, they're saying this is normal or white people deserve it or black people are down. I mean, that, that, that's, that attitude, they're very explicit about that attitude and that influences their coverage. And the and the euphemisms they use. I mean, rioters are called protesters. Uh, then bringing in the the local politicians. You have the mayor of Baltimore saying that these are these. It's essentially just a temper tantrum, and they need they need their space to to act out. So this ties no, no, in. Well, remember, to, you remember that quote? Remember the exact quote? They need their space to what? I don't remember. Express or they, something. They need no no no. They need their space to destroy. Oh, to destroy. Oh. There you go. And it's okay. Let me, let me, and all the reporters are sitting there going, yeah, okay, that sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so we've got the reporters that, that we're really, for whatever reason, I think it's uh, political and you've got blacks that uh, black reporters that feel like that they've been emboldened, white p- reporters that don't want to be chastised, called out, and uh and, and some of which white reporters that actually agree with the white guilt thing. You have a situation like at the senior's um, place of employment uh, where government agencies and the, sco- uh, the schools, etc., are have these individuals come in and teach these sensitivity training in which it gets thrown out there. Oh, you should, you're an insensitive prick if you're white and you're not willing to forgive and, and just, you know, be, ho- be beholden to the black community because of slavery, uh, post, post-traumatic slavery disorder, which is insane. The whole fight is insanity. But what we find is that this is what you're combating along with that mentality. And we can sit here and we can say we can call it out. And you say that when you encounter that, that you don't you don't try to challenge it or change it. You just of course I challenge it. Or ch- but, or, but but no, we're not going to change that person's mind. Good Lord, nobody challenges this. That, but this that's whole thing the more than no look. No that's the challenging mindset. this more than I am in the entire country right now. I agree with that. I agree with that. But that is. Is the concept that has been inbred for so long and now we have a government that is paying for the indoctrination of that concept so the numbers of individuals that we're coming across that still believe and have that mentality are growing while ours are dwindling so I don't know wh- about the growing and dwindling part but I do know a lot of people mm-hmm. are really really starting to expect more and they're really demanding more truth and they really have a lot less patience for these fairy tales of white racism and i see a lot of that hey did you ever hear before uh trayvon and and zimmerman came about did you ever hear the term white hispanic before because that was new to me (laughs) yeah i'm actually one of those people that know a little bit about the whole you know what's race what what's ethnicity and, and 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 no, I've never heard the term, but you know the the amount of mental gymnastics that these major newspapers will go through to to avoid saying what's really going on is, you know, it's hard to under it's hard to overestimate it. Suzanne, no, I'm just going through. Um, of- I was looking at the chapter here about why Trayvon's best friend seems stupid and uh, just about the critical race theory. It seems to sum it up. White racism is permanent everywhere and explains everything. More blacks in prison, racist cops. Black unemployment, racist employers. Black drug use, 
racist cop, ignore white drug users, uh, black health, black crime, black poverty, racism, racism, racism. And this is, uh, this is also part and parcel to Singleton's curriculum. So that's permeating um, our school system. It's permeating you know, our children through the teachers who have to go through and espouse these theories so they can keep their jobs. And uh, that's like when I say we need to combat this, that it's, it's been my mantra since I've been coming on the air, whether it be um, Constitution and what uh, the Constitution and what our founding fathers and the and the ratifiers wanted this country to be. Well, how do we combat the the lies that I heard at the National Park Service? I'm going to get on and and try and convince as many people who will listen, whose mind are open to the truth, so that we can eventually change this around. But right now, we've got an administration, especially with this election year coming up, that is going to thrive on K. Chaos. They are going to foster chaos. We have the trial going on so far. What is it? A hung jury? Has anything come back? We've already had the protesters or people being interviewed saying we are going to riot if there is a not guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. So the jury's been sent back. Um, so what have we gotten as a result of all these riots and chaos? Well, now we've got nationalization of an already militarized police force. And then after we have a mass shooting in San Bernardino, our, our attorney general calls it a wonderful opportunity. Um, I mentioned that last week to change the way we police communities. Well, you know, that's going to be more militarization, but also, interestingly enough, the coddling of the, the black criminals, which you've put forth in this book so many times. And it's also um, part of the cover up where um, you had mentioned politicians uh, of the local communities not wanting police reports made. The police don't make the reports. So the crime statistics looks better. It's better for housing. It's better for business. It's better for tourism. And, and but it's, it's, important, it's important for people to know what you just said was a front page story on a couple of dozen papers around the country, but nobody is connecting the dots about, you know, all, all these different towns are saying every their cities cooking the books, but nobody's saying, hey, look at all these other cities where that's happening. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Susan. No, no, and, you're, and it's like lambs to the slaughter, and then nothing happens. It's just a grander scale of of the, the little girl looking for help or guidance or protection and being turned away and somehow saying, well, I guess this is the way it's going to be, and it doesn't have to be that way. And so, and so every day... Every, really, every day, we turn on a TV and we can see a story of how white people are causing relentless victimization, I like your word, perpetual victimization. And the only way we can fight back with that is just to keep confronting them with this perpetual amount, perpetual disparity between white and black violence. And it's and irrefutable. I and we just and it's exactly. irrefutable, and we just have to keep throwing the videos at them, and throw the stories, throw the videos, throw the books, and every time we get off the every time we get off the reality of this disparity, and we start talking theories and causes and solutions, we lose every time we say, "Hey, what? Ha hey, that crazy guy Colin said in the last two weeks, there's been a dozen old women killed in their homes by black home invaders. What's up with that?" And that's where I'm just, I just put my feet down and that's where I'm, nobody budges me off that. Well, and that's you can't refute well, facts, tool. no matter how much the media and these, these progressives and, and the race baiting politicians try to put forth this proposition that it's excusable and it's somehow our fault. People are going to see a pattern here. And let me give you an example, because I was um, visiting my parents in California. I was sitting out on a bench having a frozen yogurt on the street with my son, and it was relatively quiet. And what there city, were... What city was this? This was in Los Altos, California, and there were there were two girls sitting there talking, um, and they were saying, and they caught my ear. Well, I I I I'm just noticing certain people are doing crimes, and gosh, I feel so guilty thinking. Yeah, they felt guilty because they recognized a pattern, and they recognized a threat. A deer knows the difference between a ground squirrel and a coyote. There's nothing wrong with that. It's primitive and it's survival. 
but they're but, feeling guilty. But you do you know, have I, I, you do here's, have here's the big, you do have a situation. What you have is a situation in this country where that is, that is the preferred response. That is what the examples that they're being taught by their families, and that's what I was was trying to get with Colin. But guys, we're at the end of our time here for this. Colin, uh, I'm going to give you just a minute to wrap it up, and uh, then we appreciate you coming. Well, happy to be here. I'll just say one thing in direct response to what Susan just said. Another popular response now is white people do it too. And so the only response to that is, could you send me some links to that? That's kryptonite. You don't get, so, you don't see the links and look mm-hmm. at the proportions. Look at the disproportionality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just send me, could you send me some links to that? White people do it too. Well, that, is and the, the, that, that's that is kryptonite guaranteed to drive away anybody that challenges you. Well, Colin, we appreciate you coming. Again, tell everybody your books and where easy they can to locate find, them. Easy to find. Don't make the black kids angry. Easy to find at Amazon. Right? Finest bookstores. It's like the only only book like this out there. Lots of great reviews. Thomas Sowell, uh, Alan West, okay. LA Times, lots of other places. Okay. And- How'd you get the name? How'd you get the title for that book? Yeah. Uh, from Kansas City, where they asked the congressman if they should put a curfew on, and the congressman said, no, we shouldn't do a curfew. All that's going to do is make a lot of black kids angry. Wow. No, we don't want to do that. Wow. Well, guys, if you're listening, uh, that's Mr. Colin Flaherty. He's given you the name of his books. We will have those posted in links on our Facebook uh, page and on our website following mm-hmm. the show. And, of course, if you would like to hear uh, this interview once again uh, or in the casual f- atmosphere that we provide here uh, you guys know that you can go to Spreaker.com, to YouTube or to iHeartRadio and pick up a copy following the show um, share it with your friends um, share the information on his book with your friends, I think it's valid information um, I, I do think it's it's very indicative of the, the problems that we are facing in this nation but, Colin, again, thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. And that was Colin Flaherty. Um, no, I, th- I think he has some valid points. I think his, his statistics are great. Um, I just, when, I, I just don't understand because we all know I'm not the typical white mom. I will challenge anybody. I don't care. Um, so when I hear them, them making a foolish statement or want to act thug or, or what have you, I, I, will, I will challenge that. But most white people won't. And I guess what I was looking for was how do you instill the courage or the necessity in most white people to make them stand for themselves and to make them call it out and yes the numbers are growing mildly but they i mean we have a vast biracial population we have so many things going on in this country so how do you address that suzanne jose go ahead senor i i'm I don't know how you do. I don't know how you do it. It's it's getting to be so much with the kids, like I said, coming out of the schools and stuff like that. That uh, you know, and he he mentioned that the teachers, you know, are fight trying to fight back against it in the unions and stuff like that. I think that, that's but, a great way to go. But, but yeah, but it's but it's. But it's they're still going to gonna have a text. situation. It's got to be in what they're learning. Well, I Otherwise, agree how with do you that. Explain it. I, I is it agree. Simply in, is it simply in me, in social media and in music and stuff like that that they're getting from TV? And certainly those are all part of the problem. But my God, they've got to be getting some of this out of the schools, out of your Common Core um, texts, out of out of the different things that they're being taught. They it has to be a part of it. Can well, I tell I'm, you what I saw in the basement of um, the library in in Salt Lake City, right where the university was? I had gone downstairs and there was a kiosk, and it was entitled the. Uh, they had a postcard or post poster board there, and it said the race card. And I thought, well, this is interesting. What is this all about? Mm-hmm. And they had these index cards where different students put forth their ideas on on racial issues. And one of which I took a finger. Uh, I'm sorry. A, well, okay, I gave myself away. I took a photo with my finger in the picture, and <laughs> it's 
said that white privilege is the cause of the evils of society oh, today. I thought, what? So, like I said, I took a picture of it. Um, and But that's what they're teaching in the universities. And again, counter- but the that's propaganda. you know that's that but I that's what I was trying to get with him is I mean we know we all have these examples I mean my my family is full of of educators I mean they can tell you many of them retired early to not have to deal with it anymore um I mean they they have to worry about uh being accused of doing something they didn't do. They have to worry about covering uh basically monitoring their own classrooms. They have to worry about lawsuits. Um I mean, you know, the the schools do not offer them the protection. Uh back in the day, you know, you acted up in class, you went to the principal's office and you got your butt tore up. Literally, and, right. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that's that's the way it was. And when you got home, you got your butt tore up because you had to have it tore up at school. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that's no longer the case. And so you do have have these teachers that are not going to challenge these students. Or they're not going to challenge their school boards. Uh, they, they're not going to unite enough to walk away from it because you do have that racial divide of, uh, of those that understand right is right and wrong is wrong and the actions of a person should be held responsible for and it has nothing to do with color versus the white and black teachers that say oh well i've got white guilt and oh yeah whitey hates us okay so i mean you know you've got that divide so there will never be that unity there but what i was trying to get him to to explain to me is you have this situation in this in in elementary school in middle school in high school in colleges our corp our, our corporations and government um offices are being uh it's being facilitated through uh sensitivity training in those environment environments so where do you make the breakaway because Again, most people are not like you and, and and you and I Suzanne. Most people are like the senor who would just as soon to avoid the conflict and and all the repercussions that come with it and just shake his head and walk away whereas you and I will spin around and say what? Well, I mean, there's there's a way to um, bring somebody about and educate them, and there's mm-hmm. a way to turn them off by shouting right. them down. Um, and there's got to be a, a, a way, you know. We on our side, we have facts; they're irrefutable. I and agree with we that. We have, and they're documented. On their side, they have rhetoric. The downside for us is that. Um, as Van Jones would say, you control the media, you control the opposition, mm-hmm. and we know who's right. controlling the media. So the uphill battle for us is to um, is to to educate, take every opportunity we can to speak the truth. I don't care what the topic is. But and again. then the other and the other one. Hold on, let me finish. The other one is to be ready to deal with this violence. First of all, you got to keep yourself safe and stay out of these areas. We're not going to be told the truth about these um, about these places that. You know, because it's be- the 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 crime rates are being hidden from us by and large. But you're not stupid. You're e- it's easy to tell what areas you need to stay out of. And my other my other fallback is if you live in a in a state where you can do it, you carry a firearm at all times, whether or not you want to open carry, whether or not it's concealed. But you be prepared to confront violence. The only remember the words of Colonel Jeff Cooper. The only honorable response to violence is an overwhelming show of counter violence and it's not just the gun it's the how you carry yourself it's your demeanor it's your situational awareness again look at who is being brought into this country i Third agree world inhabitants from I the middle east from the south but, and we better but, get ready but it seems when well, that's what i was trying to ask him is how do we deal it he says i do not get into these verbal debates if someone starts talking the insanity of white guilt or um or or uh the historic reference of slavery then i don't even waste my time with that well that to me is 80 percent of the population 
eighty percent of the popu- population. That's his thing. Exactly. And, and everybody's but if right he's, to have their thing. His tool in the toolbox is facts. We I can agree. go in and discuss all but the you know, like have we do to often have, on our show. But you have to have someone receptive to facts. And we're talking about a very small percentage of the, of the population is receptive to facts these days. We've had, as we, as we pointed out with you, 45 years of indoctrination to where we are now. We didn't get here overnight. No, didn't. And we weren't that bad seven years ago. We were making progress seven years ago with certain sectors of heavily populated areas being a problem. Now it's become a national problem where unless you live in a a, a community that is less than 5% black, you are dealing with it. Mm -hmm. One of our listeners just posted something or sent us a message actually specifically and said, remember Alinsky too, get the schools, get the kids. If you get the press, Van Jones, and the kids, Alinsky, you have you have to undo a lot of damage without the platform to do it. And that's if you stop and think is. about it, eight years ago, prior to Imam Hussein, the news media would tell you about black on black crime. They tell you about black on white crime. They will not do it anymore. Unless it is such a horrendous story that they cannot get away with. I the don't know that they would. And it just, I don't know there. that it, eight years ago that they would. I, 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 it's hard for me to they, remember. They would but. report the news. They would report I, the uh, news. I think it's been a, long, a lot longer than that, but I mean, maybe you're right. I don't, I don't know. When I was in California last time, I was listening to the news. My parents would always have it on. And, you know, they'd come up with stories about crimes that had happened in the area. And this is in the Bay Area, so you get a lot from Oakland, from San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, they ne- I mean, I grew up listening to these reports, and they would always have a description of the perpetrator. Okay? Well, demographics, what are the majorities disproportionately of the perpetrators? And what's missing in the descriptions now? A uh, six-foot-tall male. If it was a white male, you'd hear. I, I mean, th- I, I should write all these down, but this is what I'm hearing. Where oh, it's a white male, you'll hear that. But if it, it's black, if it's Hispanic, they leave they leave that out. And you know, it's good information to know if you're in that general vicinity and that person's armed or if they've just committed a rape. Wouldn't you like a, a description of the perpetrator so you yourself know what to look out for? Can maybe say safe or say safe or have some We've Call got law in. enforcement. That- that are being told that they're not allowed to profile, they're not allowed to determine whether or not someone was ge- was someone's gender or the color of their skin. Oh, we've got some loose... Per- Dude just killed 15 people over here. Oh, excuse me. Some person just killed 15 people. What do they look like? I have no idea. <laughs> or hey, he wanted to know if they were Christians before he shot them in the face, but we're still looking for a motive. <laughs> I mean, the, but that, that's right. the thing is that is the insanity level that we're dealing with. And one of our longtime lizard listeners says it best in yep. the words of Orwell, facts don't matter. You can present irrefutable facts until you're blue in the face and it won't change a damn thing. He says, Suzanne, ask people what Lincoln did he and freed if the they slaves. even know who he is, I'll bet you'll get he freed the slaves. You going to refute that? Well, yes, you and I would. You and I would. Senor would not. He would shake his head and under his breath say, idiot. Senor. I'm right here being accused and (laughs) called out. Apparently. (laughs) Worldwide. Because you're a nice guy and because of your job. (laughs) Well, I think that's probably why you're on the radio ranting and raving and getting something to do with it. Um, Our message out the way we can. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you don't have the liberty that Suzanne and I do. So that you don't have to respond to everything. That's the way I was raised. You don't have to get involved in every single thing, especially when you're not going to change it in the first place. You're just talking to, I guess, make yourself happy. I don't know. So that's the way I've been. But how do you educate? Walk away from a fool. Walk, but, you let a fool be a fool. You're not going to change their heart. You're not going to change their mind. Walk away from them. My Simple question is, how do you educate 300 
plus million people <laughs> in this country when your government and every uh, communist socialist organization and every dollar of every mega million socialist communist in this nation is funding for all the children to be indoctrinated and it has been going on for the better part of 20 plus years so the the opportunities to meet someone and have a civil conversation in which you inform with facts and you listen and it goes back and forth in a very civil manner are minimal i okay directly responding to that and of course time is of the essence i don't think you can and that's why one of the things that bothers me is everybody's so worried about who the next presidential nominee is gonna be and all this stuff folks if we don't change it in the schools if we don't change it it, from when these kids are becoming, you know, President their minds are forming the and they're being formed intentionally, we're in trouble. And I don't think I don't think you can unless you have a total overhaul of it. And there's nobody that's going to do that. There is nobody that's going to be able to successfully overhaul every aspect, everything. It's not going to happen. And that's right. why that's what concerns me. And I hate to be pessimistic. But unless you do that, I don't believe you have a chance because right. we're not going to live forever. We're already older. They're the ones that are coming up. And that's the way they've been raised. And how do you re- how do you go against that? Well, that's why Hillary said you've got to get yep. to these kids early. Right. It takes it well, wasn't just it yep. wasn't just to educate them. Yep. Guys, I hate to to cut in here, but we are out of time. We have run right up to time. Suzanne Sherman, want to appreciate you for joining us on Tuesday night as usual with your recurring guest host position. Enjoyed it and enjoyed your guest. Thank you. It was fun being here. Guys, uh, we're we're WTF, the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Show. We are live, unrehearsed, unscripted, PG-13, but never PC, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Thursday. You can find us on the WTF.